Welcome to the fifth episode of the Character Course. This week we'll be talking about gratitude. Now, if you cast your mind back to last week, you'll remember that we were talking about forgiveness. And it's easy to think that forgiveness and gratitude are quite different qualities of character, that they have nothing to do with one another, that extending grace and forgiveness to one person and appreciating what's good in another aren't quite the same thing. But there are actually hidden, deep connections between forgiveness and gratitude. Mike McCulloch, the psychologist, alludes to this when he says that whereas forgiveness is a positive response to a negative event, gratitude is a positive response to a positive event. And we noticed in passing that forgiveness involves giving that forgiving another person involves graciously, freely empathizing with their situation, even if we don't feel they deserve it. Whether it comes from God to you or you to someone else, forgiveness is the courageous, costly giving of a free gift. This concept of gift is also woven into the fabric of the attitude of gratitude. When you look at the prayers, the reflections, the journals of people well practiced in gratitude, they're full of the notion of gift, that life is a gift, their friends are a gift, their health is a gift, their relationship with Jesus is a gift. And theologically speaking, both gratitude and forgiveness draw on the concept of grace, God's free gift to us. And even the Greek of the New Testament emphasizes this with root words for forgiveness and for thankfulness wrapping themselves around the word charis, the Greek word for grace. So whereas last week we looked at how we live in grace when things don't go our way, in the face of disconnection, frustration, injustice, cruelty, this week we'll look at how do we live in grace when life seems to be on our side, in the face of beauty, wonder, kindness, and goodness. This week, we're going to look at gratitude. The scientific study of gratitude is undoubtedly one of the success stories of positive psychology. The the research that tells us how do we live well? How do we find a good life? For example, in international research on hundreds of thousands of people, there are certain strengths of character that time and time again are associated with flourishing and satisfaction in life. We've already looked at two of them. So hope and love, unsurprisingly, what we find is that if we love deeply and hope consistently, then generally speaking, we live lives that are flourishing and abundant. But gratitude is often in that list too. That people who have it, people who practice it regularly, are among the happiest people on the planet. Arguably, the leading researcher in the science of gratitude is Bob Emmons. Some of his early research on gratitude was actually done reluctantly. He was one of 55 scientists gathered together to come up with the list of character strengths that later became known as the VIA classification of character strengths and virtues. And he wanted to study humility, but as part of that project, he was allocated gratitude. It was a bit of an inauspicious start, but as a result, what he discovered is that allocating people to complete even simple tasks like keeping a gratitude journal could have transformational effects on various parts of their lives. He put it like this, our groundbreaking research has shown that grateful people experience higher levels of positive emotions, such as joy, enthusiasm, love, happiness, and optimism, and that the practice of gratitude as a discipline protects a person from the destructive impulses of envy, resentment, greed, and bitterness. They recover more quickly from illness and benefit from greater physical health increased feelings of connectedness, and improved relationships. When people experience gratitude, they feel more loving, more forgiving, and closer to God. Gratitude, we have found, maximizes our enjoyment of the good. And of course, the scientific literature on gratitude has absolutely exploded since then, leading to all kinds of debates about how often should we be grateful? How can we teach gratitude and thankfulness to our children? 
How does gratitude relate to other virtuous qualities like humility and generosity and kindness and forgiveness? But one of the things that was evident, even in those early studies, was this, that practicing gratefulness can have an absolutely transformational effect on our lives. And that's a perspective that the Bible generally, and the New Testament particularly, wholeheartedly endorses. Before we go any further, it's probably important that I say something about definitions. You've probably noticed already that I've been using the words gratitude and thankfulness as if they're the same thing. And I guess from my point of view, they kind of are roughly similar. But whenever I present to a skeptical or an atheistic audience, I often find that they're keen for me to separate the two ideas. Gratitude is not the same as thankfulness, they would say. And the reason for that is that in everyday language, we tend to use the two concepts in different ways. We tend to be grateful for something and thankful to someone. I was listening to the comedian and writer Ben Elton being interviewed. And the interviewer asked him, do you believe in God? And Ben Elton said, well, on my most courageous days, I'm an atheist. On other days, I'm not quite so sure. And so the interviewer pushed him a bit and said, but if there was a God, what would you want to say to him? And Ben Elton thought for a moment and then simply said, I'd say thank you. Both thanksgiving and gratitude imply a gladness, an appreciation of the gifts that have been given to us in the world. But thankfulness particularly implies that behind all of that, there is someone to thank. And when we look in the Bible, that's definitely the view of the world that's held by the writers there. Let's start with Jesus. Nowhere is the transformational power of giving thanks seen more forcibly than in the life of Christ. Thanksgiving is crucial to two of the most important episodes in the Gospels. For example, in all four Gospels, Jesus and his disciples find themselves in a painful supply and demand quandary. They've managed to attract a capacity crowd to his speaking, and yet they've forgotten to book the caterers. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. Jesus doesn't obsess about the problem. He doesn't sack Dave from logistics. He doesn't implement radical austerity measures or even beg God to help him. He simply acts in prayerful gratitude. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full and there were about 4,000 people. He feeds a multitude with very little. Following thankfulness, he believes that they have everything they need. It's in his thankfulness to God that what they have becomes enough to go round. In all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus does the same thing at the Last Supper. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus takes what he has and gives it away with gratitude. In the Last Supper, he's saying, just as there was enough bread for everyone, so too there is enough grace for everyone. Gratitude assumes abundance, that God has already put enough goodness in us 
and around us to allow us to thrive. And we see something pretty similar in Paul as well. Some people would put Jesus and Paul in opposite corners of the theological boxing ring. Whereas Jesus is liberal and compassionate and accepting, they say that Paul is sort of homophobic and prejudiced and fanatical. But actually, we completely misunderstand Paul unless we read him through the lens of thanksgiving. And joy as well, actually, but, but we'll, we'll get to that next week. There are at least 53 occurrences of thankfulness in Paul's epistles. And that's even more striking when we realise that in all the other letter writers in the Bible, whether we look at Hebrews or James or Peter or John, the tally of gratefulness, of thankfulness in those epistles is zero. Paul, 53. Other epistle writers, nil. For Paul, thankfulness is vital for Christian living. He tells us he is thankful. He thanks his readers live in real time. And he commands us over and over again that we should be thankful too. To the Philippians, he tells them, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. To the Colossians, he says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. To the Thessalonians, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But he is most often thankful for what he's seen God through Jesus do in other people. For Jesus and for Paul, the world is plentiful in good things and hidden potentials that only make themselves manifest to those who are thankful. This biblical view of gratitude as being able to multiply good things interestingly mirrors the psychological work on gratitude too. One of the reasons that gratitude seems to work so well for us is that it undermines one of the psychological mechanisms that leads us to be dissatisfied with life. It works like this. We tend to look for things that we think will make us happy. So it could be the job promotion, uh, it could be the romance, it could be the car, it could be the shoes, it could be the family. But in pursuit of those things, we tend to fall prey to a fantasy. We tend to overestimate how happy we'll be when we get those things, and we tend to overestimate how long that happiness will last. But the fact is that when good things occur to us in life, we tend to adapt to them quite quickly. What made us happy at one point very, very quickly becomes normal. We thought, if only I could get this, if only I could get X, if only I could get fill in the blank, if only I could get that thing, I would live happily ever after. And yet two weeks later, we're wondering where all our anticipated bliss went to. And if we're not careful, our lives become the pursuit of things that we think will make us happy with ever diminishing returns. Psychologists call this the hedonic treadmill. It's almost like we've stepped onto a treadmill chasing what will make us happy and it's not quite working for us. This is where gratitude and thankfulness can help us. As Bob Emmons has said, when we are grateful, we take things as granted, not for granted. When we're thankful for something in our lives, we receive it as a gift, as if for the first time. We don't see it as old, but we see it with refreshed eyes. We see it anew again. In thanks, the all too often ignored backdrop of our lives, our bodies, our home, our families, our communities, our work, our planet, become illuminated as the gift that they are. When we're thankful, we multiply the goodness that's around us. Our thinking becomes thanking. So that's gratitude. Whether we look in the Bible or in the world of psychology, there seems to be some agreement that gratitude, thankfulness, is an incredible transformational quality. And if I'm honest, 
Most Christians I meet, most people who have a genuine devotion to Jesus are pretty good at it. They have an implicit expertise in thankfulness. They have an awareness that their life floats in a sea of grace and gratitude, thankfulness is a natural way of responding to that. We can all be a little bit more intentional about it and that's where our session takes us today.